Tanya has been a long time friend of Phoenix Books and back when it wasn't even Phoenix Books, when it was the book rack down in Winooski. Right. She's known Mike and Renee, the owners, uh, for, I don't know, 20 years or so maybe? 15 or 16 years, yeah. A long time. Uh, I've known Tanya for a long time too when I worked at Borders. We worked there uh, on a number of events too. And uh, it's amazing uh, for such a small state that we have so many great authors um, in the state and Tanya's definitely one of them. And this is just a, a fabulous book, and we're really excited to have her here. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Every time I um, do an event or teach a class or, or talk to a group of people, this always happens. I always feel like the teacher who's sort of saying, come sit in the front, come closer. But I'll just talk loud. Um, so I'll just tell you a tiny little bit about myself as a writer, and then a little bit about the book and then we can do questions. I've been writing books for 15 or 16 years, um, and I think I'm at 97. Yeah, Jake's saying, yeah. So, um, and I have two more coming out, so that's 99. So get ready for a big party, because as soon as we hit 100, we're gonna have to do a really big party. Um, I write picture books for young kids, I write nonfiction for older readers, and I write young adult fiction. Um, this particular book, Courage Has No Color, was a book that started out as a picture book 10 years ago and proved to be too unwieldy for the picture book market. It just didn't work. Um, and so I kept putting it away and pulling it back out and kind of trying to figure out what to do with it to make it work. And um, frankly, when my editor at Candlewick said, we love this book, but you need to make it a big book like Almost Astronauts was, I kind of pitched a little bit of a five-year-old temper tantrum and said, no, I'm tired. I don't want to do that. And she said, okay, you know, we know Almost Astronauts was a lot of work, and then you wrote Barbie, and that was a lot of work. Why don't you take a nap? <laughs> Why don't, you know, we talk about this in a week or maybe two when you're not so cranky. I said, okay. And it really was the first time that I had ever kind of copped an attitude with an editor on the phone. So I really was very tired. Um, and I did see the error of my ways and kind of called her after a couple of weeks and said, OK, all right, you're right. This does not work as a picture book. This does need to be a much longer, bigger book. I need to put World War II in historical context. I need to kind of set the stage for what was going on in America at the time with segregation and what was going on with race relations in the country for, for readers to really understand why this is an important story not just the what, but the why. And so I kind of started over with the um, essence of the story of these men in my mind, but kind of starting over from scratch as I wrote. Um, so I'm going to just go through a kind of a quick slide presentation. But there is a book trailer, um, and I'll post it. And you can see it on my Facebook page and on my website. It's a, it's a short book trailer page. Um, the book opens with a second person point of view scene of what does it feel like to jump out of an airplane. And this is uh, a paratrooper in 1943 at Fort Benning, Georgia, jumping out of an airplane. And that is the first picture in the book. And so it sort of does give you a sense of the, of the ground below and how high up it was. And, um, OK. And what did it take to be a paratrooper in World War II? It took a lot of specialized training. It was a very specific kind of training. Extreme physical fitness a lot of courage and bravery. I mean, think about, think about that. You're, jumping, you're learning how to jump out of an airplane onto a battlefield. That's what you're doing when you're a paratrooper. And until the 555th became the 555th, white skin. There were no black paratroopers at all. And of course, this was 1943. We were living in a segregated nation. There were different entrances for movie theaters, for restaurants. There were colored water fountains and white water fountains. And we had a segregated military. That meant two things. Most of the time, it meant that black soldiers were relegated to labor duties. They were guards. They were dishwashers, cooks. They did the laundry. They drove the trucks, right? Down here in the corner is a picture of the Tuskegee Airmen. 
So um, they were one of, a, one of a few, a handful of groups that were experimental test platoons in the military in general. Um, but they were only together as a unit. They, were, they did not fight side by side with white soldiers. You want me to do it? No. Oh, you did it. OK. So this man right here, his name is Walter Morris. And he turned 92 the day after this book came out last week. Walter Morris was a young, newly married man with a baby in 1943 in Fort Benning, Georgia. And that is standing in front of the house at the barracks in Fort Benning, Georgia. And there's a whole story that goes with this photograph because from this photograph, the historian at Fort Benning right now, and I, mostly him, were able to find his exact house and put a historical marker there last month. Last month from this picture. Um, so Walter, Walter was uh, first sergeant in charge of the um, guard duty soldiers. The black soldiers were all on guard duty at Fort Benning. And what they were doing was they were guarding the parachute facility. So they were in charge of keeping the facility safe. And they basically watched the white paratrooper students go through all of their training. Walter was depressed. He saw his men depressed. He was concerned. As they went on sort of day to day, he was concerned with overall morale. And he had this idea. And it didn't have, the idea didn't have an agenda at the moment. The idea was just, I wonder if this would raise morale for my men. And he said, well, what if the black guards on their off day mimicked what the white paratrooper students were doing? What would happen? So that's what they started to do. They had guard duty service one day, and then they were off the next day. And so they started to alternate and rotate. And each day, they would, as soon as the white paratroopers would leave the field and go into their barracks, the black guard soldiers would go onto the field and do everything that the white students had done during that day. And this went on for a little while um, until a general called Morris to his office. And Walter was kind of worried. He thought he was in some big trouble, right? Um, and, he, and he remembers riding his bicycle to General uh, Ridgely Gaither's office and wondering, you know, what's this man going to say to me? Uh, you can go ahead. We saw that one already. Other way, hon. That's OK. One more. OK. So, um, so sort of picture the camera stopping as Walter rides off to General Gaither's office to find out, am I in trouble? Pull back from Fort Benning, Georgia, and what's going on really kind of behind the scenes all along? Um, <clears throat> Todd, was there water somewhere? Is it behind me? Yeah? It's on the bookshelf? Oh, I thought this was just like a pretty little vase. <laughs> OK. So Walter has ridden his bicycle to General Gaither's office, doesn't know if he's in trouble or not. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, sort of in the rest of the military world, there are things that are happening, because Walter's not the only one who's upset about the situation. Um, up here, this is Eleanor Roosevelt, and this is Mary McLeod Bethune. And what they're doing is they're um, putting together what becomes the first black cabinet. Um, there, are, there are March on Washington movements. This actually didn't happen. This was um, a threat that had to do with integrating the military. And over here is a political cartoon made by a guy named Charles Alston, who did a lot of political cartoons whose point was, and the point of these cartoons were to um, encourage the black community to join the war effort and come together and be more unified. Uh, what does this one say? Workers wanted regardless of color. These cartoons were interesting because the War Department, war department hired Charles Alston, who was an African-American illustrator, to do these cartoons thinking, won't this be great? This highly esteemed African-American illustrator is going to publish these cartoons. All the black newspapers will run them, and it will really have an effect and an influence on the community. Instead, what happened in many cases were the newspaper editors said, well, you're kind of selling out, and we don't think we're going to run these. So it didn't work quite as well as the War Department wanted it to. 
But then the good news up in the upper right-hand corner is that things were happening with some experimental test platoons like the Tuskegee Airmen, like the 761st Tank Battalion. And <clears throat> that is um, General Benjamin O. Davis, Jr., who um, was the son of General Benjamin O. Davis, Sr., who became the first, um, I'm forgetting his exact title now, but I do believe he was the first four-star black general in World War II. If there are any military buffs in the room, they can feel free to correct me. So this was going on behind the scenes. Okay, Liza. And so General Richley Gaither was not angry at Walter Morris. In fact, what he said was, why don't you tell me what's going on? What, why, what have you been doing with your, with your men? And Walter told him the story. And he said to him, well, I might have some good news for you because it looks like the powers that be are going to give the okay for putting together the first black paratrooper unit. And so that's, that's what started to happen. Liza, next slide, please. Okay. But, of course, their story doesn't end there, and I'm not going to tell you the whole book here because that would just not be fun for you. Um, but but one, of the, one of the things that I will tell you is that they had more and more and more specialized training as time went on. So they became an extremely efficient, highly skilled combat unit, um, and a lot more than the first group of the initial men joined. So the company grew, um, but they kept getting passed over for combat sort of again and again and again. So instead of being sent out for combat, sent overseas, they were given more specialized training, which was a tactic that was going on in the military. There were, there were, there were people in the military that were trying to move this idea of integration forward and the success of the experimental test platoons they were hoping for, and then there were people on the other side of the coin. And then finally, they were dispatched for a secret mission. Um, and, and that secret mission is, some, is, a, is a very, very little known um, event that happened on the west coast of our continental U.S. Um, and there were actually six Americans killed on U.S. continental soil during World War II from this secret mission that I'm going to let you read about for yourself, not spoil the surprise. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the beginning of the story of who these men were. There are three surviving members of the initial test platoon still alive. And as I told you, Walter turned 92 two weeks ago. Uh, and I had the pleasure of going to Fort Benning in September with Walter um, because they finally had dedicated a monument to them at Fort Benning. So that was pretty exciting to be there with, with him. And he's you know, still spry and just so thrilled and so happy to, to, do, to be there and be able to witness it. Um, and that's, that's just a great thing. So one of the reasons that I love promoting this book, because I, in general I don't love promoting my books. It's not my favorite part of this job. Um, but I, lo I, do, I am very much looking forward to promoting this book because this is a group of men who should be as well known as the Tuskegee Airmen and the 761st Tank Battalion, etc. But really nobody knows who they are because nobody's written a book about them yet, basically or made a movie about them, or you know, done anything to bring kind of mass attention to who they were. So they are, were, the Triple Nickels. Um, and I, I think it's time to sort of shine a light on them before the rest of them are, are not here to witness that. So I'm, I'm kind of thrilled that three of them are, are still with us and able to, to be around and kind of enjoy the celebration. So thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, I have not met the other two in person. Uh, Clarence Beavers and I have spent a lot of time on the phone talking, um, and the third is, has been too ill. You know, books like this don't get made without help from historians and archivists, and um, when I say this book took 10 years to put together, part of the reason for that is that this was a story that was scattered in little bits and pieces all over the place. So. I really had to sort of use all of my journalistic and, and detective <laughs> tendencies to find every little piece of scrap of mention of them and start to put the story together, um, dig into the oral history archives. Um, and the whole photographic piece of it was just a whole other layer that took a few years. You know, I was using Zabba search to find you know, nieces and nephews of long deceased 
men just to find you know the one picture of one guy so I, could, I wanted to get as many of them in the book as I could um, and there there really wasn't any kind of archive of their photo well I have the archive now I guess um, so I should probably work on putting it together yeah how many were there of the paratroopers do you have any in the original test platoon there were 17 oh wow there were 17 and the first group of officers were six so, but then that grew, you know, as they moved, as they moved on mm -hmm. with the program, they uh, put, sort of put the call out for more volunteers, and, and it grew and grew. So they were disbanded at the end of uh, World War II? They were actually folded into the 82nd Airborne under um, General Gavin. And get this, they marched in the victory parade down Fifth Avenue in New York City with the 82nd Airborne, wearing all of the decorations that the 82nd Airborne, who had been in combat, pretty amazing. And that was eight months before integration. So, I mean, really, they were the first integrated soldiers. And they never went into combat. So it's, it's really interesting little tidbit of information. Yes? <laughs> um, she wanted to know what inspired me to write the book. Did you get the other questions as well? No. Okay. So I'll repeat the questions okay. as they come. First time. <laughs> um, what inspired me to write the book was find was learning about these men that they existed and what they did, um, and discovering that no one really knew who they were, and just being motivated. I, you know, I think if there's any theme to my work in general, it's finding these stories of people who are little known and who have done extraordinary things. I mean, that's basically what history is, right? I mean, it's. I mean, history, our world is made up of stories of ordinary people doing extraordinary things, and there are a lot of missing pieces of history in our textbooks, in the information that we get as students, um, you know, all the way up from middle school, high school, through college, and as adults. So I think it takes, it takes books, single title books written by authors who are interested in finding out all of these stories to sort of start to fill in the missing pieces of history. Yes. How did you hear about them? You um, she asked me how I found out about them. And I think, but it was a long time ago, um, I think it was just somebody who mentioned it to me, sort of like, oh, you like underdog little known stories. Have you ever heard of these guys? I think that's what it was, but I can't pinpoint it exactly. Yes. Could you? Sure. Um, I haven't finished it, so you might address this. <laughs> but I'm sort of a word nerd, and I'm curious, is there a story behind the spelling of Nichols? There is a story behind the spelling of Nichols, in fact. Um, it's a complicated story, and there's more than one version of the story. Um, and that's pretty standard when you're talking about history from so long ago, and you're asking different people their opinions. Um, kind of like, you know, when you're reminiscing about what happened at Thanksgiving with the 20 people that were at the table, you're going to get some different stories. Um, one story is that it was in deference to the Buffalo Soldiers, and then sort of combine that with the Buffalo Nickel. And since they were the 555th, they took the, th the three Buffalo Nickels, Buffalo Soldiers, Buffalo Back Nickels, sort of put the whole concept together and came up with the Triple Nickels which came after the 555th designation. So that's that story. The spelling, there is no explanation for, <laughs> including the president of the Triple Nichols Association. He has no idea why it's spelled the wrong way. But it's, now it's spelled the right way. I mean, now that is the right spelling. It's been autocorrected enough times. <laughs> Anytime their story pops up, it should have the incorrect spelling be known as the correct spelling. Yeah, it's a funny thing. Any other questions? Yes. She wants to know if I tried jumping out of a plane. I did not go that far. No, I did not go that far. Um, but for my, for my Almost Astronauts book, I did sort of get close to a lot of that aviation stuff. Um, you know, suited up in the pressure suit, went over and, and you sort of looked into the cockpit of the F-16s. and. So I, I've sort of done as much as I could without getting in the air, although I'd like to. <laughs>
Can yeah. you comment about being a white person writing about race? Sure. Um, in fact, this past Friday night, we just had a, I just had a very long um, filmed conversation with Ashley Bryan, who wrote the foreword to this book. Um, Ashley is an African-American illustrator um, and was a soldier in World War II. He was in the 305th Port Battalion as a stevedore. Um, and three of his art pieces that he drew as a soldier during the war with a sketch pad in his gas mask are in this book. So he and I have been talking about this for quite a while. From 10 years ago when I sent him the first picture book manuscript that I had written about this, I uh, asked him that. Um, and in fact, I couldn't really come up with a, a smooth way of asking him about this at the time. So I just sort of bluntly said, you know, Ashley, I want to ask you something, and I'm just going to come right out and say it, which is, you know, should a white Jewish girl like myself be writing this book? And he said without a split second of hesitation, you've written it with passion and respect. No one else has come forward to tell the story after all of these years. And so absolutely, you should write this story. Um, you know, it's a story that needs to be told. And it's an American story. So, you know, he basically said, if anybody tells you that you shouldn't be writing it, you stand by what I said. Um, and in the children's lit field, Ashley Bryan is sort of the grandfather of all. So people in the children's lit field will, will, will take that excuse. Um, and, and I believe that. I, I stand by that. Um, and, I, and I do think, sort of, where do you draw the line at some point? You know, we're writers. So if it's fiction or nonfiction, I'm a white Jewish girl. Should I not write about a boy? Should I not write from the perspective of a boy because I'm a girl? You know, I mean, you could take that so many different directions. And I think in nonfiction, you have to back it up and become the authority on a subject. So you have to, you have, to have the goods to stand behind the story so that you can call it your own. And I think that's what I've done. I hope that's what I've done. That's a great question. Any other questions? So there's a lot more to the story, as I've intimated. And um, we should have cake. And I'm happy to sign books. And if you think of any other questions while we're mingling, please feel free to ask me. And thanks for coming. Yeah. I, uh, she wants to know if I talked about the process of getting the pictures. I touched on it a little bit, um, just that it took a couple of years. It did take a couple of years, and it was sort of like needles in a haystack. Um, some of them came from the 82nd Airborne. Some of them came from the National Archives. You know, I could sort of flesh out National Archives that were sort of larger um, race relations in America kind of images. But when it came down to the actual soldiers in this story and the pictures of them and where they were, that was really... Uh, time-consuming and so incredibly thrilling every time I found that next picture you know I, mean, I remember actually um, one about a week long it took me to find the niece of one of the guys and the number that was you know on the internet that I had found didn't turn out to be her at all but it was someone related to her so I had called and left this this uh, message can you imagine like coming home one day and finding this bizarre message from just some random woman who's asking about photographs of your long deceased uncle? Um, but this, this young man was nice enough to call me and ask me a couple of questions and then say, so the person that you're really looking for is my aunt and here's her number. And so then I called her. And lo and behold, she actually had an email address because a lot of the people I was talking to didn't have computers and weren't digital, mostly because of their age. Um, and it was his niece, and she did have the family album, and she started scanning pictures of Sam Robinson, um, smiling, like sort of posing in his, in his paratrooper outfit, and it was fabulous. She just kept sending me these images and all of these little miniature relationships developed between me and every one of these other people that managed to get me a photograph. So in the acknowledgments section you're going to see a lot of names and uh, um, that's partly the reason. So it was like finding little hidden jewels and being able to kind of put back together this archive that that had been scattered to the wind. 
So she asked me if, if finding any of these images has, have put people back in touch with each other. Um, <clears throat> there were a couple of instances in which they did, in fact. And um, one of the reasons that that was successful is because of a guy named Joe Murchison, who um, runs the Triple Nickel Association. And so Joe has this crazy Rolodex. You know, he's old school. Um, he's a little bit younger than the first group of guys, but you know, he's 80. And he keeps this Rolodex system that he keeps taking cards out of and putting cards back in. So anytime I found somebody new, he would find out where they fit and then send them out an invitation to join the Triple Nickels Association again. And so a lot of people who had kind of left the fold came back in, which was nice. And at the um, monument dedication in Fort Benning this fall, it was also in conjunction with the Triple Nickels Association reunion. So it was really phenomenal. I mean, we had two big Greyhound buses full of Triple Nickel members who came, everybody flew to Atlanta and then got on these buses and, and bused to Fort Benning, Georgia. And it was like a big reunion party. All different generations, you know, but all related in some way to somebody who was in the 555. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it.